for many of us. Some of the earliest stories that we remember hearing from the Bible are stories like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. These are parables told by Jesus that seem to find their way into our memory, that they, they stick. In this video series, we're talking about different types of literature, different genres that we find in the Bible. We want to talk now about the genre of parable. No one uses the parables with as much skill and precision as Jesus himself did. That We find them in other places in the Bible, but Jesus uses them more than anyone else. That These parables that we hear, like the Good Samaritan or, or the Prodigal Son or uh, the, the, the Unforgiving Servant, they find a way to stick in our memory. Parables are incredibly memorable. And it's important for us to understand what type of literature, what type of communication they are. Thus, we, we interpret them correctly. Maybe no other portion of the scripture has such a diverse history of interpretation as the parables do. There is a long history of them being misinterpreted and therefore misapplied. Now, we don't want to be foolish and slow of heart to believe. We want to read the word. We want to understand it correctly that we might apply it to our lives. Now, I remind you throughout this series, we're, we're using this work, 40 Questions About Interpreting the Bible by Dr. Robert Plummer. Uh, that Plummer deals with all sorts of issues in this book, but particularly uh, with the issue of genre. And then in one chapter, particularly the issue of, of genre when we talk about uh, parables. And you've probably heard a parable defined before as an uh, earthly story with a, a heavenly meaning. It's not a, a bad definition, just probably doesn't go far enough. That often what we find that is that when we hear of the parables, particularly in the Gospels, they're often related to the kingdom of God. Not always, but often related to the kingdom of God. And, and even within that broader theme of the kingdom of God, we're often dealing with themes like the graciousness of God, right? The, the cost of discipleship, the, the cost of obedience to Jesus, or, uh, or the cost of disobedience. What happens when we, um, we reject Christ, when we run from the kingdom? The, uh, Jesus is using these parables not simply to entertain, not simply to be memorable, but in order to teach, uh, to teach his disciples, to teach those who are around what the kingdom of God is like and what it means to follow Jesus. So in this video, I, I want to give you just five sort of principles to think through uh, when it comes to uh, how, how we interpret the parables, how we see them correctly. First, when we're talking about determining meaning of the parables, the first thing we want to think about is, is how do we find the main point? Uh, the, the parables have a main point. They have a main teaching aspect. And, and we really need to seek as we read the parables to, to be thinking and asking, what's the main point of this? Where is Jesus pointing his disciples? Where is he pointing the crown? And thus, where is he pointing me by this, this parable? And we, we do that by sort of thinking through the elements uh, of, of the, the parable. So we're asking, who are the main characters? So to think about the story of the prodigal son, for example. So you have... You have the son, you have the father, and you have the older brother. Who are the, who are the main characters? Uh, what occurs at the end of the parable? Not always, but often the end of the parable is the emphasis. The end of the parable tells us the main point. So, so what happens, not just at the beginning and the middle, but what happens towards the end of the parable? That often is a hint for us of the emphasis of, of the parable. Uh, third, what's happening in direct dialogue? Right? Who speaks in the parable? Who speaks most often? And, and when they speak... What, what's said? We're, we're paying attention to the quotation marks in the text that we're, we're paying close attention to, to direct dialogue. Uh, and then uh, what or who gets the most space? Right, so maybe some pieces, uh, uh, you know, I think, for example, the, the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Right, the innkeeper doesn't get much space. Who gets the most space in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, the two main characters uh, are the, the man who's robbed and the Good Samaritan. Right? So it is a pointer to us of what the parable is about. So when we are looking at a parable, our goal should be to determine what's the main point here that we may understand it and obey it. We may apply it to our lives. So that's principle number one. Seek to, to determine the main point. Who are the characters? What's being done? Who's saying what? Who's getting the most ink? What's happening towards the end of the parable? Right? We're looking for uh, the, the main point of the parable. Uh, second, we want to try to, as best we can, recognize stock image. Uh, I believe Plummer gives this example in his book that he uh, occasionally will, uh, to, to prove this point, uh, call out a, an international student in his class and, and to ask them a question to say, if I were to show you a cartoon of an elephant and a donkey fighting, what would that mean to you? And often the international student will come up with some sort of explanation that is nowhere near to the truth. Even now, if you, my guess is that as you're watching this, if you were to look at a cartoon between an elephant and a donkey fighting, you would immediately know what that is because you recognize those, those political symbols. that you, you understand that stock imagery. 
We understand when Jesus tells the parables, he's often using imagery. He's using language that's all around them. So he, as they're uh, walking along the, the roadside, he uses images of a vine and branches. Right? He, he knows that those uh, people, those hearers that, that are around him, understand farming. He knows that they understand agriculture. He knows that they understand vineyards. He, he uses imagery. He, he knows in, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he knows that they understand the geography. Right, of what it means to, to go through Samaria or to go around Samaria. So we have to, to begin to try to put ourselves in the mind and in the, in the eyes of the first century hearers, that those who, are, who Jesus is talking to, to say, what sort of images is Jesus using? Is it a vine? Is it a vineyard? Is it a, a, a way traveled? Is it a road? Well, what are the pictures? A mustard seed, right? What are these pictures that Jesus is using? Uh, and try to determine what, what do these things uh, represent? What are these stock images? Uh, how is Jesus using them? So, Remember, we're looking for the main point. Uh, second, we want to recognize stock imagery. Uh, third, we want to note striking or unexpected details. Uh, things that, that seem to shock us. Uh, now, sometimes we have to be careful because we just don't understand it well enough. That, that uh, Maybe you've heard the story for just your whole life and what should be shocking to you is no longer shocking. So you think of details like the parable of the unforgiving servant who... Uh, who owes his master uh, an enormous, unpayable sum. It is a massive amount of money. And uh, the king uh, or his master forgives him. He forgives him the debt. And then he leaves and he, he goes to his friend who owes him the equivalent of a couple hundred dollars uh, and, and says, you pay me it all now or I'm going to have you thrown in jail. That as Jesus tells that parable, the disparity between what he's been forgiven and what he's demanding is, is a striking detail, right? That he gives us those amounts, not simply so that we could know, but so that it might really set us off. That we might say, I can't believe that a servant who's been forgiven this much would be so unforgiving and demand this little from someone. It's a striking detail that Jesus gives us so that we would know. Uh, Jesus, uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, tells us how much money it costs uh, in order for this Good Samaritan to have this man cared for. Right? The point is that we might see what great personal loss this man is at as he's taking care of the Good Samaritan. So be careful to look for big, striking details, details that make you stop for a minute and say, that's not what I expect. So the, the parable of the the man who, who finds a treasure in a field and goes and he sells all that he has to buy the field. The point of telling us that he sells all that he has is meant to strike us. That what's in the field is so valuable. He doesn't just sell some things. He has to sell everything that he has that he might come uh, and buy the field. Uh, Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son. When we're told that the father sees the son a long way off and what does he do? He runs to him. Whew, that should be a striking detail to us. Middle Eastern men don't run. And yet this father is running to his son. That tells us something that, that gives us an idea of where the parable is headed. So we're looking for the main point. Uh, we are trying to recognize stock imagery, what, what, what sort of things is Jesus pointing us to. We are uh, trying to, to think about and notice strong or, or unexpected details, what Jesus is, is uh, giving to us. Fourth, it's related to that. We also have to be careful to not to press all the details too much. Right? Parables are not meant to, to be allegories. Right? The, 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 the genre of allegory and the genre of, of parables are not synonymous. There is some overlap. If you're looking at a Venn diagram, there's some overlap. But they're not the exact same thing. And so sometimes, often in the history of interpretation when it comes to parables, that's what's been done. The people take the parables and begin to try to allegorize every single piece of the parable so that everything in the parable has to mean something. So uh, you think uh, the church father Tertullian did this with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so uh, the Good Samaritan is the father and the robbers are the devil and uh, the innkeeper is the church. And, and he just finds every single detail in the parable and, and tries to find some corresponding, some uh, allegorization there. Uh, we have to understand that's not the point of the parables. They're not to be allegorized in every single detail. We, we shouldn't press every detail. Uh, so you, you think about Luke 15, the parable of the Good Samaritan, or the parable of the, the prodigal son, rather. Uh, when the father brings his son home, he puts a robe on him and he puts a ring on his finger. We shouldn't be asking, well, what do those represent? What is the robe and what is the ring? But instead we're asking in the context of the story, what are they? They're symbols of the father's acceptance of a son. That's what a father would do. He would put the robe on him and put the ring. But they're not meant to represent something. Not every detail in the story is meant to point to something else. That, that sometimes they're just there to give us the details that we need to understand the story, or to move the story along, or, or to give us a proper, uh, proper background. 
If we think about the parable of the unforgiving servant, the amounts that he gives us, right? How much the guy is forgiven versus how much he demands, that those individual amounts are only meant to help us to see the disparity. That we shouldn't say, well, he, he uh, is demanding a few hundred dollars from his friend, so therefore that number represents this, or he was forgiven this amount, so therefore that number represents this. That's, it's beyond the point of a parable, and it's misunderstanding what parables are. Right? They're, they're pointing us to in a main direction, in a main point that Jesus is trying to make so that we would believe him, so that we would trust him, so that we would follow him, so that we would be like him. So be careful about overpressing details. I, I believe Plummer gives the example uh, of somebody preaching a text, uh, the, the parable of the, the man who finds the treasure in a field. And he allegorizes the whole story and he says, well, the, the man must be Jesus because it can't be us because we can never buy salvation. That's not what salvation is. You can't buy it. And in the story, the man buys salvation. Uh, so that, therefore, the man must re- represent Jesus. And right, he's, this is this whole explanation that is built on the misunderstanding of what parables are. Every piece doesn't have to correspond. Uh, so that sometimes even there are details in a parable. There are pieces of a parable that are meant to contrast. So the parable of the, the persistent widow who goes to an unjust judge and pleads her case again and again and again until he finally hears her. The point of that text is to say, if an, is not to say that God is an unjust judge, but to say if even an unjust judge does this, how much more will God, who is just, hear the prayers of those who are persistent? Right, That's the, that's the point. Uh, so don't, don't press the details too much. Be careful there. And then fifth, the fifth principle to think through and understand and interpret uh, parables is to consider the context, right? Both uh, literary, historical context, uh, the, the way in which we, the, the, the parable is presented. So let's go back to Luke 15. That when uh, Jesus gives us three parables right in a row, the parable of the lost sheep, uh, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son, that those come in the context of Luke 15 where we're told that because Jesus is eating with sinners and tax collectors, the Pharisees ask him, why do you eat with sinners? And it says, and in response to that question, Jesus told them these parables. But really it says Jesus told them this parable, right? That's all to be one taken as one big parable. Right? That Jesus is teaching the Pharisees about who God is, about his heart for the lost, about the way that he receives sinners. Right? That gives us a huge clue as we help to understand the parables, knowing why Jesus, uh, why Jesus tells them. The parable of the persistent widow. Uh, that Jesus, uh, rather Luke, as he presents that, that parable to, to us, says that Jesus told them a parable to this end, that they might pray and never cease. That Jesus, or Luke gives us the reason right there at the beginning. Here's why Jesus is telling us this parable. Luke is sort of pulling back the curtain and saying, here's the main point of the parable. Now listen to the parable. Right? So we want to listen to the literary context. Why is Jesus telling, telling the parable here? Who's listening? What's happening? What dialogue surrounds it? What, what context? What's, what relationship? Who's he telling it to? When's he saying it within the relationship of Jesus in the Gospels? How far from, away from the cross are we? How, how far away from the beginning of his ministry? Right? We're asking all these questions to help us give a, a good context. We don't come to the parables and just decide what they mean on our own. But we want to listen well to the text itself uh, that we may know what the parables mean, that we may apply them. Now again, as with every piece of genre of the literature, uh, uh, genre of, of uh, literature in the Bible, the best thing you can do is to read. Read the Bible. So there's nothing better you could, for you to do than to read the Bible. You want to understand parables? You want to get better at interpreting them? Read them. Meditate on them. Ask for the Lord's help. God has promised us, us by the Holy Spirit that he'll open our eyes, that he'll unstop our ears, that he'll soften our hearts, that as we read it, we can, we can know. So my challenge to, would be to you, if you want to know the parables, be like the man who finds a treasure in a field. And he goes, well, and he sells all that he has that he might buy that treasure. This is the word of God. It is a treasure to us. It is the, the God of all the universe speaking to us in his word. We ought to give our lives to the study of this word. And that includes the parables of Jesus. That we may know him, that we may love him, and that we may be like him.